All right, what a good day to be here at Grace Church. Amen. Uh, last night, I uh, got a text alert on my phone about the uh, situation going on in Israel and uh, began to follow that for a few hours and even checking it in the middle of the night when I woke up and then again this morning. And uh, like you, um, I'm concerned for the state of our world. Am I alone in that? No. Okay. Uh, so the people of God are called to be warriors of prayer, ambassadors of peace. Uh, it's countercultural and uh, maybe even controversial. But this is our charge because the battle that goes on in the world, the battles, are not simply uh, nation versus nation or people versus people. There is a spiritual warfare component that goes on. We're battling, battling against principalities and powers that are unseen. And that's where uh, we as a church need to come together and, um, and pray. So I want to do that now, if that's all right, before we start our message. just want to invite you to still your heart. And uh, if there's an image or something you've seen, you might want to bring that before the Lord. And uh, let's go to the Lord before prayer, in prayer. Today, Lord, we're answering the call to be your people and to bring everything before you in prayer. Today, we lift up the ongoing conflict in Israel. Some of us have been there, walked on that land and among those people. Today, we're going to look at a story from your word that comes from there. So, Lord, we believe we're in agreement with your heart that peace would reign in that region and in the hearts of all those who are involved. We pray that they may seek understanding and reconciliation rather than violence and division. We ask, Lord, that you would grant wisdom to the leaders and peacemakers so that they might work towards a just and lasting resolution to this conflict. We pray, Lord, that your peace, which passes all understanding, would be poured out upon the land and poured out among its people. And that in the name of Jesus, violence would cease. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Everybody agreeing with this prayer said, Amen. 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 Well, we're here because the Lord has a better way. <laughs> He's got a better way. And it's found in that book that our third graders now have in their hands. And we are very excited about that. My papa, the last time I met him uh, at a nursing home, met with him, he, uh, I said, is there anything I can do for you, Papa? He said, if you wouldn't mind to pull out my Bible for me, and he was 88 years old. He said, would you finish reading the prophet Isaiah for me? I'm afraid I might not finish it before I go to heaven. And I uh, sat down and read the rest of Isaiah to Papa. He had a little jingle, he would say, and that when it comes to the scriptures, that every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. And we as the people of God, have an opportunity today to live into that even more. So when I was a uh, first starting in ministry for 12 years, I was a youth pastor. And once a year in central Kentucky, I would take my youth group to the greatest amusement park on planet Earth. Now, we didn't come to Disney. I'm sorry, I'm just going to go ahead and say that. This is a, this could give me some letters, and I understand that some of you are Disney people. Uh, the park I like to take kids to was uh, like two hours away instead of 20 hours away, and it was called King's Island. Oh, yes. Have some of you been there? Oh, good. I'm among friends. I was like, this, this may not go over well when I was writing this sermon. So the uh, amusement park King's Island has got the best roller coasters in the world. So I took these kids. We go into the park. I got them in their groups, and then they started going around the park. So I was walking around, trying to check out, make sure everybody's with somebody. And I came across three eighth grade boys who were sitting on a bench. And I said, fellas, what are you doing sitting down on a bench at King's Island? And they looked up at me and they go, man, we're bored, mister. 
I'm like, bored. You cannot be bored at King's Island. It's, it's, yeah, I think it's illegal. Kids, you can't do this. And uh, I said, why are you not riding roller coasters? I said, well, we're scared of roller coasters. We're scared of heights. We're scared of darkness. We're scared of all these things. And I said, okay, fellas, for the good of humanity, I'm going to have to intervene right now. I said, uh, tighten up your shoelaces and follow me. We're going to spend the day together. And so off we went for the next seven and a half hours. I immersed them and introduced them to all things roller coasters. <laughs> we started with the little simple kids rides and then we worked our way up until finally they rode the beast. Check out the beast, greatest wooden roller coaster of all time. Some of you have been on it. When they got off this roller coaster, they were so thrilled. They were giving each other high fives. They went and bought t-shirts and said, I rode the beast. And then they were cheering and uh, saying, what a ride, what a ride. Can we do it again? Can we do it again? I tell you that story because some followers of Jesus are sitting around on benches and they're bored. When the adventure of a lifetime awaits, here's two words that never go together when it comes to authentically following Jesus. Uh, apathetic discipleship. Or how about bored Christian? Those are two oxymorons. We talked about oxymorons last week. Those are two things that don't go together. They're not supposed to exist according to what we read in the Bible. The Bible was, is filled with story after story of what following God and following Jesus looks like. And the last thing on the list is boring. It's boring. Now, I was really introduced to this by a mentor that came into my life uh, in my mid-20s. His name is Mike Iaconelli. Here's a picture of Mike with his little mischievous grin. Uh, Mike, he never knew what he was up to. He was always uh, unpredictable. He was always filled with joy. And he introduced me to the adventure of following Jesus. See, I'd grown up in church. And, uh, well, when it came to a choice, if there was a choice that was given to me, it never was. Like if my parents walked in my bedroom and said, waking me up in the day, would you like to go to King's Island or would you like to go to church? Can I be honest with you? I would be like, let's go to King's Island. It's fun. Not so with Mike. In fact, Mike compared his Christian life to actually riding roller coasters. He wrote a book called Dangerous Wonder. And here's just an excerpt of what it was like to hang out with Mike. Here's what he wrote. I want a lifetime of holy moments, he said. Every day I want to be in dangerous proximity to Jesus. I long for a life that explodes with meaning. And it's filled with, what's the next word? Adventure, wonder, risk and danger. Oh boy, I'm starting to wake up. I long for a faith that is gloriously treacherous. I want to be with Jesus, not knowing whether to cry or laugh. Now that sounds anything but boring to me. And Mike was like this. He was wild. You never knew when he would stop and go love uh, some person on the side of the street. You never knew when he would break out in praise. The guy was just, he was, he was a wild man. He was a barbarian Christian, and I loved it. Because he was anything but boring. A few years before he died, he shared these words. He said, if I were to have a heart attack right at this moment, I hope I would have just enough air in my lungs and just enough strength in me to utter one last sentence as I fell to the floor. What a ride. What a ride. Friends, the Christian life is the adventure of a lifetime. Jesus is calling us to an adventure called discipleship. You and I are invited to be a part of this, and this series, Flawed Faith, is to help us. We're studying a guy named Peter who probably would have loved roller coasters. Uh, the guy was kind of impetuous. He was impulsive. You never knew what he was going to say. And Peter is a model for us at what it looks like to be a disciple. Now, last week, uh, Taylor Brown introduced us to this guy, Peter, and the encounter took place in Peter's hometown of Capernaum. He was a fisherman there, and Jesus comes to him, and he says these two words that changed Peter's life, but actually, whether you know it or not, because we're sitting here in a thing called church, changed our lives. Jesus said these two words, follow me. Would you say those with me? Follow me. And so he began a journey of growing in his faith, maturing in his faith. Now, sometimes this is kind of ethereal and mysterious. Like, are you growing in your faith? Well, I don't know. Today I had, you know, a bad day, so maybe I'm not growing in my faith. 
Or are you growing? Your well, sure I am. Because I got the parking place I wanted next to Target. And I, I, it was a great day. Is that what it really looks like to grow in faith? Well, some really smart people that study theology and faith development from Fuller Theological Seminary put together a little diagram for those people that like to have charts and stuff. Visual learners, here you go. What does it look like to grow in faith is a growth in stages of discipleship. The first is what we talked about with Peter last week, a life-changing awareness of God. And where all this goes through all these different stages, we're going to kind of walk through them in the next few weeks, is the end result is to be transformed by love. That's the bullseye. Everybody understand? To be transformed by love so that we would be saturated with the love of God in our life and know that we are the beloved of God. And then the cool thing is we'd be so saturated we'd spill out onto other people that love. I don't know what happens to you when people bump into you, but sometimes when people bump into me, uh, the love of God ain't spilling out. Uh, I'm sorry if you're here, but whoever decided to close the Edison Bridge, could we have a talk after this service is over? <sighs> okay, that's not in my notes. But anyway, I've got a ways to go to get to this thing of transformed by love. Um, so today we're going to take the next step in looking at Peter's life, and, and this is where the stage is called discipleship. Now, what is discipleship? Well, we're going to take a look at a, a story that can help us begin to get a handle on what discipleship is, and we're going to see how Peter serves as a model for all of us in this. Now, with discipleship, what does it mean? It simply means this, to be a follower, to be an apprentice, uh, to walk in the steps of a leader that we want to be like. Does that make sense? Let's keep it real simple here. Because that's all it is. It's uh, to let Jesus be our mentor, teacher, and Lord. That's the key. He's not just another person with some good ideas. But we say to Jesus, I want to take you up on your offer that you gave to Peter when you said, follow me. So Jesus, I want to follow you. Is that anybody's heart here? I want to follow Jesus. How about you? I, I want to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, still I'm going to follow. There's something inside of my soul that is calling me to live a life better than just what the world has to offer. I'm sorry, but I don't like the options when it comes to just the world. I don't like watching the news and go, that's it? There ain't nothing else? I don't like looking at Twitter and, or whatever it's called, X, and finding that's all there is. I, I, don't, I don't like uh, Facebook and seeing that this is the greatest life that I could possibly live, to live like one of the influencers, whatever that is. And this is not my thing. It's not my jam. I'm not really into that. There's something deeper. Don't you feel like life has been uh, uh, set up for you and designed by God for you and you feel this calling maybe inside of your life to get on the adventure of faith, not just sitting bored. Let's do that together, shall we? Let's step into this thing called discipleship. Today we're going to uh, look at a story, just one story, and it's from Matthew's Gospel. If you've got your new third grade Bible, you can open up to Matthew chapter 14. So Matthew's in the New Testament. It's one of the four biographies of Jesus. Go to the big number 14 and the little number 1. No, 22. And here's the story. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead of them to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. While he dismissed the crowd. See, he was feeding the multitudes at this point with the little boy's lunch. You might have heard that story before. And after he dismissed the crowd... He went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat, with the disciples in it, was already a considerable distance from land, uh-oh, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So a storm's coming. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them. Read the next four words with me. Walking on the lake. Whoa. Turn to your neighbor and say, whoa. Whoa, whoa, right, all right, let's keep going. Bless you. Uh, when the disciples saw him coming, uh, saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus, Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus says. 
Then Peter got down out of the boat, and he walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Again, whoa. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, and he caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and those disciples who were in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, truly you are the Son of God. All right, what a story, right? It makes me say, whoa, this is incredible. So even if you've heard it before, don't let it just pass you by. We've got two sightings. of we got Jesus walking on water and then a regular dude named Peter walking on water. There's four insights about the adventure of discipleship I want to share with you from this story. The first one is this. Jesus comes to us in the storms of life. Jesus comes to us in the storms. This is good news, isn't it? Have you noticed that not all storms are weather-related? Some of them are in categories not of one, two, three, or four, or five, but they have names like relationship storms, financial storms, mental storms, anxiety storms, uh, decision storms, storms of addiction, storms of affliction, storms called trauma. You know about these storms as well? See, a lot of times the writers of the Bible would use weather to be an indication of something deeper. And so we can assume that it, the disciples were struggling not only with the weather, but with their faith. They're struggling with fear. They're struggling with doubt. Again, look at this passage of Scripture. What emotions do you notice here with the disciples? They saw him, and they were terrified. They think Jesus is a ghost, maybe. And they cried out in fear. Jesus said to them, Take courage. He needs to give them courage because they were struggling in this moment. And when storms come, they can leave us afraid and confused. Now, chances are somebody here is either coming out of a storm, you're headed into a storm, or you're right in the middle of one right now. Can you name what storm you're facing in your life? Is there something going on that's causing you distress? Now, I wish I could say that real disciples never experience trouble or fear. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, that'd be great. I would love to be able to preach the sermon that says, you know what? If you become a follower of Jesus, everything's going to go your way, and you're going to get rich, and you're going to have the parking place that you want at Target, and everything is going to work out perfectly, and everything is going to be neat, and there won't be any more questions or mysteries and all those things. That would be the best. And let me tell you, there are false teachers out there that do claim such things. The problem is, that's not in the Bible. Ask a third grader. They're going to tell you that the Bible is full of faithful people who encounter trouble. But here's what faithful people like yourselves and sometimes myself can take courage in, is that Jesus comes to us in the middle of our troubles. He comes to us in the middle of our storms. In other words... You're not alone. The journey of discipleship is a journey with Jesus, no matter what's going on in your life. Remember, remember the central uh, symbol for the movement of faith of following Jesus is a cross. And sometimes uh, we go through storms in life and need to remember that Jesus came to us in the middle of our storms and he actually went to a cross. I think that's an important symbol. I love that we have a cross above my head uh, focusing us in worship. I like that we still have barely a cross on our steeple outside. I even kind of like that it's bent, to be honest with you. The last storm did leave it straight. It's kind of bent over a little bit. But you know what? That kind of describes me. I'm a, I'm a little sideways. Uh, I've, been, I've been through some storms, you know. And you have too. It kind of describes our church. That God's grace comes to us even if they're a little bit crooked. And Jesus crawls upon the cross and he dies for us. But he enters into our suffering. And then he defeats our suffering. We can know this. That these days of war and tears and distress and grief. They have an expiration date. And it's when Jesus comes back. Can you say amen? amen. 
Jesus comes in the storms of life and he will come again. Here's another adventure. Uh, here's another insight on the adventure of discipleship. Disciples yearn to follow in the steps of Jesus. They yearn for this. Let me ask you a question. What are you yearning for in your life? What is it that you have this deep desire for in, in your day? What are you hoping for today? Uh, for Peter, he is actually taking this thing of walking in the footsteps of Jesus. If you ask me and the other 11 disciples who stayed in the boat, he's taking this a little too seriously. Because he actually wants to walk in the footsteps of Jesus while Jesus is walking on water. Have you let that sink in yet? No pun intended. Look again at the verse. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Peter has this desire to get out of the boat where I would think he would find it comfortable. And he wants to follow Jesus even there. He wants to go all the way. And he initiates this. Jesus doesn't call him. Not until after he says, hey, Jesus, can I come too? See, there's a desire there to follow Jesus. Do you have that in your life? I'm praying that I would have that in every area of my life. I'm not there yet. But I'm praying that I would be able to follow Jesus. And here's what that really looks like, I think. I'm going to make it plain for us. It means that you and I need to take some risks like Peter. If this is discipleship, and we don't ever want to experience that boring discipleship where we just sit and soak and we sing... Well, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that'll be. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Again, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength right now. The joy is present for the joy that was set before him. Jesus endured the cross. That's what the Bible talks about when it comes to joy. It's not something that happens later. It happens right now. You're invited into this. Can you say amen or I'm alive or something like that? Okay, good, good, good. Because I'm trying to invite you to life to the fullest. I'm trying to invite you to, to, to leave the boring life behind and follow Jesus. But, but it does take risk. It takes the adventure of getting out of your boat. It, it, it takes experimenting with new things. A few years ago, Pastor John Ortberg wrote a book about this exact scene in the Bible. And I think Captain Obvious could have come up with the title because it was called, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Got to Get Out of the Boat. Wow, thank you. That was deep, but it's true. If you want to experience new things with Jesus, we got to get out of the boat. So let me ask you some dangerous questions, maybe to just consider in your soul. Uh, where are you tired of playing it safe? Or what is Jesus calling you to that would require some risk on your part? I've got some suggestions that I'm working on in my life. You want to hear them? I mean, you, can, you don't have to apply these to your life. This is just me. Um... I can preach, and I love preaching that God so loved the world. And yet, the risk would be for me to embrace even more that God loves me. Like just as I am. Like right now. I was talking with Pastor Taylor Brown about a difficult night of sleep I had last night. It's all based on my insecurities. My brokenness. And it would do me good to risk following the words of the Bible that says, God not only loves the world, but he loves you. And I want to invite some of you who struggle with the same things I do to maybe try that out. Maybe get out of the boat. Of, and what the boat looks like is, no, I'm not lovable. You don't know me, Lord. I, I struggle. I, I'm a loser Christian. I'm a Kmart pastor. I, I'm not good enough. <laughs> and Jesus is saying, uh, well, Peter is modeling for us. No, get out of the boat. Let's go. Okay, somebody else, you, you, you might be ready to take the risk of forgiving someone. Uh, you might need to make a call today and just trust Jesus. I'm going to get out of the boat. I'm going to call him. I'm going to say, you know what? In the name of Jesus, I forgive you. You might want to trust God with your money. Talk about a risk. You know, we wouldn't try to control things. Instead, we'd say, Lord, it's all yours. In fact, I'm going to give away the first of what you've given me. That's a risk. <laughs> it's a risk to trust God in our relationships, isn't it? And do it his way. When it comes to our dating relationships, when it comes to marriage, intimacy, what if we actually trusted God in those areas to live life God's way? i got one more, just in case you're not 
yet uncomfortable a little bit with the thought of risk. I hope you feel like you're getting ready to get on the beast because it's a little bit like that. Oh boy, but God's calling me. I yearn for this. How about we trust God with our time? We say, Jesus, I'm going I'm to follow you and your example on this. And you know, it's out, the, all this is to bless you. You know what Jesus is first going to say? Why don't you take a Sabbath? Why don't you take a break? Let me control the world for a day or so. <laughs> I've shared with you before how difficult that is for me, a pastor. You mean Jesus? You want to be in charge of the church? That's so silly. God's like, yes, I, I think I can handle it for a day. So we were in a meeting this week, and um, we remembered this line from a sermon by Pastor John Tyson. He said, uh, the simple truth that God comes where he's wanted. If you want to know more of God, if I want to know more of God, this has to be the yearning of our heart. And can I take you behind the curtain? What do you, you know what I'm yearning for? And a group of us here, we're yearning for you to have that desire with us. That God would know that the people of Grace Church want him. That we want him so much. That we need his presence so badly. That we believe in him so much that we're willing to risk it all. Because he has called us to this life of abundance. But it requires risk. Look with me at the third insight we can come up with, with uh, come out of this uh, passage with. Discipleship is more about direction than details. Um, when Peter gets out of the boat, notice that he doesn't get a lot of details on how this is going to come. In fact, look with me at what happens. He says, Jesus, let me come to you. And Jesus says, okay, come. <laughs> There's no explanation of buoyancy here or put on your floaties, uh, you're going to need a mask. There's none of that. <laughs> he just says, all right, come on, come on. That's just like Jesus, isn't it? That's just like Jesus. Not a lot of details, but a clear calling on our lives. And friends, this is what it looks like to take those steps of faith. One word is we just take Jesus at his word to come to him. And there are times when Jesus' will is very specific. And his way is specific. His teaching is specific. But there are lots of times it's not. For example, when Jesus says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There are some details, but really it's a direction that we live our life in. Right? We place him first. In what things? Uh, I guess everything. There you have it. How about loving yourself? Remember the Bible says, love your neighbor as you love who? Yourself. You're in second position there. Let God's love flow into you. Then you can spell out his love to others. Well, how do you do that? Well, God gave you incredible creativity. You can find some ways to enjoy the presence of God in your life. Maybe you like music. Maybe you like uh, going to the beach. Maybe you like uh, reading and diving into God's word. Whatever that is. How about loving your neighbors? Well, this is where you can be very creative. There have not been a lot of times that I've had to turn, literally turn the other cheek because somebody punched me. Uh, you know what happens instead? God says, I want you to be inventive on how you can love them. So some people close to me know I've sent a lot of gift baskets in my life. And they have the words on them. I'm sorry. I was wrong. And then the ter terrible words, will you forgive me? <laughs> because I, God says love. And we just that's a direction to live life. Make sense? And when I was growing up, we had this uh, sign in our, our house. In fact, it hung over the sink. They gave me some reassurance. And it is this. The will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. Yeah, there's not a lot of specifics. Well, guess what? There wasn't much for Abraham either. When God called him to go to a land that I will show you. Where's that? Or Esther, who has to go face the king as a Jewish orphan with the promise that perhaps you are called for a time such as this. Again, that's not a lot of details. And so a lot of times God gives us a direction to live in. To Peter, he just says, come. All right, one more. One more insight on discipleship from Peter's story here. As I grow in my faith, Jesus will lift me up. Everybody who knows this story and you just heard it read knows that at the end of the story, Peter runs out of steam and he sinks, right? Look at it again. Uh, he takes his eye off uh, and he cries out, 
he takes off Jesus, he sees the wind, and he cries out, Lord, save me. And the Lord reaches out his hand and catches him. And then there's these words, you have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? We'll come back to that in a moment. And then they climbed into the boat. They joined the rest of the disciples, and they were ready to worship Jesus at that point. What is this, uh, ye of little faith? How, how was that said, do you think? Much of my life, I thought it was a very condemning thing. You of, Peter, you of little faith, Jesus said. You of little faith. And then I was reading some commentaries last week, and I realized that was a term, those words in uh, the original Greek are an endearing term, like you would with a little kid. Oh, little one. <laughs> oh, little faith, come here. Why'd you doubt? They're very tender. Isn't that something? Whew, some of us just got set free. And as you look at the rest of the Bible, little faith, uh, that's really cool. Isn't it uh, mustard seed of faith? Uh, moves mountains? I mean, just... A little bit of faith can raise the dead to new life. I mean, little faith, that's not bad. That's not bad. And after all, where are the rest of the disciples? I imagine, I imagine Peter was insufferable later that night at dinner, right? Yeah, fellas, where were you? Missed you out there on the water. <laughs> but this journey of faith comes with the promise that no failure is final. In fact, that's a part of learning. Across the river, we've got Thomas Edison's house, and he never failed in his life. But if you go walk through his workshop, you'll see a, a bunch of duds when it comes to experiments. But here's what he said about that. I have never failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that things don't work. <laughs> and see, faith, all it takes is a little bit. And Peter has that. And Jesus bails him out when his faith runs out. See, his faith was strong, it just wasn't sustained. And later on, we find that Peter's faith is sustained. How does Peter's story end? Well, it continues on through his own writings of letters in the New Testament. But we have one scene that takes place at Pentecost that tells us that Peter is a changed man. When people gathered because the Holy Spirit fell upon the believers in Jerusalem, uh, there was a giant crowd gathered around and there was a huge opportunity for somebody to tell up the story of Jesus. And who steps up? We'll take a look at Acts chapter 2. Then who? Peter steps forward. Peter is the one that steps forward. I think stepping out of the boat helped him step forward those years later. So this is discipleship, friends. It's following Jesus. And here's the take home for the day. Becoming a maturing disciple requires risky obedience risky obedience and so I have a question for you in what ways do you need to risk something new in following Jesus in what ways do you need to risk well we don't know exactly how the story ends they eventually the disciples of Jesus make it back to the shore and I guess they pulled into Peter's boat slip Maybe there was one of the guys that was there to help him uh, put the ropes uh, around the, the uh, boat, pull up to the dock. And here's how I like to imagine that day ended. That this boat hand says to Peter, hey man, how was your trip? And he looks at him a little stunned and then starts to grin. <laughs> and he says, my trip across the sea with the storm and Jesus and all I got to say is, what a ride. <laughs> what a ride. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, we thank you for the calling to join you in the great adventure. And Lord, that is a bit uncomfortable for us. We like our boats. <laughs> we like playing it safe. And you have called us. You've called us to take courage and to trust in you. And so I pray that you would help us to do that today. Because Lord, the life you have for us is better and it's even more than we could ever ask or imagine. So Lord, we choose to worship you now and surrender our lives to you in new ways as you call us. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody agreeing said, Amen. So we're going to open the altar now, and if you want to come up 
and, and just pray a prayer of risk around some area of your life where you're just going to say, Jesus, I need your help to risk following you in this area. That would be one a reason to come here to the altar and pray. If you want somebody to pray with you, lift a hand. But you may be going through a storm or some other reason you'd want to come and, and kneel and submit your life in that posture today. And you're welcome to do that. Otherwise, you can make your seat a place of prayer. And let's worship the Lord and let's sing these song, this song as a prayer from our heart yearning for more of Jesus. Let's worship.